Wofford College combines a challenging liberal arts education with a close-knit campus community. Located in Spartanburg, South Carolina, Wofford offers 25 major fields of study and a faculty that mentors students to think independently, develop goals, and work creatively. At Wofford, 93% of students choose to live on campus all four years. It's an enriching residential experience that culminates at The Village. The NCAA Division I Wofford Terriers compete in the Southern Conference across 18 teams. As the Terriers continue to excel with community support, they're always the best game in town. A few miles away is Wofford's Goodall Environmental Study Center. Overlooking Lawson's Fork of the Pakalit River, the center features exceptional opportunities for hands-on environmental experience. While Wofford's campus can take your breath away, nestled in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains and just a few hours from the beach, Wofford ranks consistently as a top 10 college for study abroad experience. Students are prepared for the world after Wofford. At the space, students learn skills and find experiences that employers need and graduate schools want. Our graduates are prepared for what's next. Wofford College, it's your world. Good evening and welcome to Wofford College. I'm Professor William DeMars, Chair of the Department of Government. We are delighted you have joined us for this evening with Governor George Pataki. We are here because of the vision and generosity of Wofford alumnus Van D. Hip Jr. Tonight is the fifth event in the endowed Hip Lecture Series on International Affairs and National Security. Van is with us this evening along with his wife Jane, so please join me in thanking them. Van, thank you for bringing to us tonight Governor George Pataki. George Pataki grew up in Peekskill, New York, the grandson of immigrants and the son of a mailman. After graduating from Yale University and Columbia Law School, he worked his way up in New York State politics, starting as mayor of Peekskill and serving in the New York State Assembly and Senate. In 1994, he won the Republican nomination for governor. Starting off with little name recognition statewide, he surprised most experts by beating Mario Cuomo. He went on to serve three terms as governor of New York from 1995 through 2006. He led New York State through the attacks of September 11th and the aftermath, and he promoted the toughest anti-terrorism laws in the nation. He combined pro-business policies with award-winning initiatives in renewable energy and environmental protection. He is joining the national conversation today uh, on the 2016 presidential race, and his own name is being discussed as a possible Republican nominee for president. Tonight, we are honored and delighted to have with us Governor George Pataki speaking on the challenge of leadership. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor DeMars, and thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, and let me just thank Van Hip. Uh, and, and his wife, Jane. Uh, Van is a great friend of mine. There is no more loyal alum of Wofford than Van Hip. He not only has was instrumental in getting the presidential debate here a few years back and in funding this lecture series. Uh, he also is one of the country's leading experts on anti-terrorist uh, efforts. We can make
think, in the 21st century, but by far the most important thing he does is he roams the sideline every Saturday cheering on uh, Wofford as the voice of, of the Terriers at every football game. So Van, thank you for being my friend and thank you for all you do for Wofford and thank you for inviting me today. Not the least of which is because when I left my farm Monday morning, it was nine degrees. It has been very pleasant down here. So it's the challenge of leadership that the, the topic is today. And I don't have my notes, so I'll do what I usually do, which is just uh, talk off the cuff. And let me begin by saying it's great to be here with y'all this evening. <laughs> I got to tell you, I've never heard so many y'alls in my life as I have over the last two days. Uh, although my son, who uh, spent 30 years growing up and going to college uh, uh, in New York or New England, uh, married a Texan, moved to Texas, and now after I think less than four years, whenever he comes home, he goes, hey dad, how you all doing? Uh, and every time he does this, I give him a hard time. Come on, Teddy. You know, you're not a Texan yet. You're a New Yorker. You spent your whole life here. And I was giving him so much grief that after his last time when he came home a couple of weeks ago, his wife sends me a map of the United States. And it has different colors. And it is coded for the you guys part of America, the use guys part of America, which is where I come from, and the y'all part of America, and she goes, Dad, take a look. Teddy now lives in the y'all side of the map. Cut him some slack when he comes home. So from now on, when he comes home, I'll allow him to uh, uh, talk uh, a little bit more like you guys sound. Um, rather than talk in the abstract about leadership, I want to I thought it might be best to tell some concrete examples of uh, uh, battles I've had when I was governor, actions we've taken, and how we were able to get the results that we did in these four cases. Uh, and the first one I want to talk about is my first year as governor. When I ran for governor, it was a startling upset. No one had heard of me and didn't think I had a chance. But I laid out a very clear agenda of how I wanted to change the state and where I wanted to take us. And I think that was absolutely essential because they weren't voting for me, they didn't know me. They were voting for an agenda that I was able to articulate and they believed it. So the first point is you can't get somewhere unless you know where you're going. Uh, and that sounds very simplistic, but I can't tell you the number of times people get off on a course and committed to an action without knowing where they want to end up. And the most important thing is to say, this is where we have to get. I have some sense as to how we're going to get there, but at least we know where we are going. And I'll just give you one example of that agenda. One of the things I said in New York is we're going to completely reform the state's finances and taxes. For the first time in decades, we would spend less than the year before. We would cut state spending, cut state government, cut the entitlement programs, reduce everything, and we would massively cut the the income taxes that were driving jobs and businesses out of New York State. The public wanted it. The politicians and the interest, which is why I got elected, the politicians and the interest groups did not because it's far easier for them to say yes than to say no, particularly when you're cutting uh, programs that people like. And there's no one who doesn't want more money as opposed to less, particularly when it comes from the government. So how was I going to get this enacted? And one of the things I realized is the entire credibility of my term, whether it was one term or two terms or three terms as governor, hinged on getting the first year right. When I said I was going to do these things, if I didn't get them done, I would have been a disappointment to the people. And it wouldn't have been the first time that people heard a politician say one thing and do something else, I don't think. But it would have been something that prevented me from standing up to the legislature and the interest groups again. So I said, we're going to get this done. And I proposed a budget to get it done. I wasn't quite sure how I was going to convince a legislature that hated the idea to do it. So the New York's fiscal year starts April 1st. April 1st came, we had no budget. 
It was not surprising. The New York State's government had been dysfunctional for years, and they never had an on-time budget. But what I ha and the governor would submit bills to temporarily keep the government running. But what I hadn't realized is the government, the governor, had total discretion over what bills and what spending it could send to the legislature, and the legislature couldn't add to it. So it dawned on me that if I didn't pay the legislature, send up the money to pay the legislature, all of a sudden, they would have an incentive to pass a budget. So April 1st comes, we send up bills to keep the government functioning, but the legislature doesn't get paid. May 1st comes, the legislature doesn't get paid. The legislators are saying, you know, you're alienating everybody, Republicans, Democrats, this is the stupidest thing. June 1st comes, it was a mostly male legislature. Every wife is saying, if you don't pass the budget in the next few days, you don't bother to come home. Middle of June, they pass the budget, cut taxes, cut spending, and begin New York on the road towards an economic recovery and financial recovery for the state. The point there is know where you have to get to. Make it clear in people's minds how determined you are to achieve that. When you say you're going to do something, get it done. And you may not know the means at the moment as to how you're going to get it done. I didn't realize. I had the authority to prevent the legislature from getting paid. But when it is that important, use whatever lever of power you have to convince those who are reluctant to get the job done. And we were able to do it. The second instant is a different example. While I was governor, we totally changed the criminal justice system. We were the most dangerous state in America, and we changed virtually every criminal justice uh, law, evidentiary rules, sentencing rules, parole and probation rules, changed it from top to bottom. And I had been governor maybe eight or nine years, and there was an enormous amount of pressure to change the drug laws, to reform the drug laws which I had inherited, which had very serious penalties for low-level drug dealers. And what I had always said when I was changing the criminal justice laws was that we wanted to have laws that were tough on crime, but at the same time were smart. And it made sense to me that a young person, a low-level street person who is himself an addict, engaging in some minor trafficking, yes, they're committing a criminal activity, but putting them away for five years isn't going to solve that problem. Instead, we put in place programs like, uh, like basic boot training, where for six months they'd be put through an intensive physical regime to make sure they got some discipline out of their violations. So we were negotiating, and I was in another enormous battle, as was always the case with the legislature, over how to change these laws. And I said, yes, I am willing to change the sentencing laws for the low-level addicts, the street corner kids, but I want tougher sentences for the kingpins, for those who deal with massive quantities of drugs or for those who have a weapon, a gun. And I remember we were screaming and yelling back and forth, which was fairly normal with me and the legislative leaders throughout my time. <coughs> and it turns out they are getting pressure from the minority community, largely African-American community in New York City, to change the drug laws because it was disproportionately young African-Americans who were being incarcerated under these laws. And I said, yes, it makes sense. But they wouldn't go along with any of the harsher treatment for someone with a gun or someone uh, who was a big time dealer. And the leader of that movement to reform the drug laws was a rap empresario some of you may have heard of named Russell Simmons. So we're having another one of our screaming matches and they're saying, well, we can't do this. Russell Simmons wouldn't want that. The community wouldn't want this. I said, let's get them up here. Bring them in. And the lesson on leadership here is don't exclude people. Don't try to do things in secret. You never know when you have a dialogue with people that you might not think you're going to agree with where you can find common ground. So Russell Simmons comes up to Albany. We begin a midnight negotiating session with the legislative leaders. We're talking through all these things, and I'm arguing for uh, tougher laws for someone dealing in drugs who has a gun in their possession. And the Speaker of the House and the staff are going, that's wrong just because the person has a drug has a gun doesn't mean they're a violent criminal. And Russell Simmons turns to the speaker and goes, I don't want people with guns selling drugs in my neighborhoods. 
someone who had been the advocate for a reform that they were citing to oppose some of the changes I want, wanted to make, when brought into the dialogue, agreed with me. And they were completely stunned, undercut, and by that morning, we had a comprehensive law to change the drug laws that provided for intelligent treatment of the, the young addict selling small quantities on the street corner, but harsher penalties for the big dealers and the person with a gun. And the answer to that is don't exclude, exclude dialogue. Don't exclude people whose opinions you might fear are different from yours, because people of good faith, when you know where you want to get, can almost always find common ground if you, if you try hard enough. And in that case, that worked. Now just a third story, and there are only two more, and then I'd love to do some question and answer because I think that's the most enlightening uh, way to uh, have a conversation, was um, months, uh, probably six months to a year after September 11th. Uh, we knew that Ground Zero had been devastated. We had suffered enormous uh, human tragic loss and we had suffered tremendous economic loss that was ongoing. And Lower Manhattan, not just where the tower stood, but most of Lower Manhattan was essentially a ghost town. Ghost town. People didn't want to be there. Businesses wanted to be, didn't want to be there. So we knew we had to create excitement and bring uh, a sense of confidence about the future back. And we knew that we had to do something very special with Ground Zero because in my mind, and I think most Americans, that is hallowed ground. And we had to preserve it. The initial move, it was controlled by an authority. They put out a plan and it came up with a nondescript plan to rebuild office towers that everybody said this is inappropriate for a site as important emotionally and historically as Ground Zero is. So what we did is we said we are going to have a public process. We are going to reach out and we created an organization that reached out to some of the top architects in the world to have a competition as to what they would do for a master site plan for Ground Zero. And in my mind, I always knew we had to do three things. We had to rebuild the 10 million square feet of office space that had been lost. We couldn't have an economic void in lower Manhattan and we wouldn't have gotten the proceeds from the loss of the towers if we hadn't replaced that. We had to remember those who were lost and reflect on their sacrifice and their loss and also at the same time show the courage with which New Yorkers and Americans from every walk of life responded. And to me, that was one of the most inspiring things I've ever seen is how courageous and united Americans were in the days, weeks, months, and over a year after that time period. Uh, and then we had to build bigger. We didn't want to think small. We wanted to rise above where those towers stood and, and send a symbol that as Americans we're not going to live in fear and think small in the face of this new era of terrorism. We're going to soar to new heights, unafraid heights, as we're entitled to as Americans. So we had this process, 52 designs, finally narrowed to, down to five designs that were developed by the architects. We had it on the internet. There were 10 million different people who clicked on to look at those five different sites. There was that magnitude of interest uh, in what was going to happen at Ground Zero. And ultimately it was narrowed down to two plans. One plan by an architect that I thought was hideous and unworkable. Uh, and just uh, it didn't soar to new heights. It didn't appropriately memorialize uh, those who had fallen and those who had showed such courage in responding on September 11th, and it didn't create the economic vitality that we needed to show to lower Manhattan and to the rest of the world. The other was what I thought was a brilliant master site plan that had a void where the towers had stood, where a memorial and museum could stand. It had a spire of office towers rising above that, ultimately culminating in a 1770, a building 1776 feet tall, symbolizing our freedom and soaring to new heights. And I said, this is what it's got to be. The problem is I didn't make the decision. We had this authority that had been empowered to make the decision. But I knew one would be brilliant and one would be god-awful. 
So, uh, so I, we had a public process. I had stepped back. I didn't want to be the dictator leader of New York State. And the morning that they're going to vote and make their decision, I get a call from the attorney for the master site plan architect that I liked. And he goes, well, I guess we lost. And I go, what do you mean, you guess we lost? He goes, look at the front page of the New York Times. And one of the members of the board that was going to decide which plan had leaked to the Times, that they were prepared to uh, approve this plan, that was absolutely hideous, unworkable, and would have been an embarrassment to New York and America for generations, in my opinion. Obviously, they didn't agree with that. So I went down, and the board was having its meeting with the two architects who were the finalists. And I went into the meeting, and I said, I want to interview the two architects. And the first architect who had the master site plan that I thought was brilliant comes in and walk them through it. it. Has it been built? Something like this been built? Yes. What would it cost? Well, approximately this. What are the practicalities? Well, we can do this. Uh, and the memorial is left open, so you can do whatever you believe is appropriate to memorialize the event. Uh, OK. We call on the other architect, and I rake him across the coals. How much will this cost? Uh, I have no idea. Has anything like this ever been built? Uh, no, nothing like this has ever been built. Uh, will there be any place to have a memorial apart from these horrible structures that you're proposing to put on the site? No, there won't be. Is there room to recreate the office space that was lost so there's an economic? No, there isn't. Uh, the architect left, and I turned to the board and said, you have got to pick the first plan. Uh, they I then left. They voted, they picked the first plan, and if you had been to Ground Zero, or if you come to Ground Zero, it will be the most visited site in America, and there is a brilliant master site plan by Daniel Liebeskin with a memorial and a museum and the Freedom Tower that tells the story of those who lost their lives, tells the story of the courage with which New Yorkers and American Americans responded, and that does soar to new heights with a tower that is the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere and 1,776 feet tall, and which opened just a couple of days ago. The example there is when it is something that is absolutely critical, when it is something that is going to have a lasting impact on millions of people, and something of such importance symbolically as well as practically as to what America was going to do at Ground Zero, if you're a leader, Regardless of the process that has been established, if you have the ability and the authority, get it done the right way. If it doesn't work, you'll get the blame. If it works, someone else will get the credit. But that's as it should be, because you will know that what was done was right for America and future generations. And the last example I want to give you of leadership is what actually happened that day on September 11th. Because, you know, you, when you think of yourself as an effective leader, uh, you're prepared. You can anticipate things. You have an agenda that you put forward in your mind or on paper or to the public. But I don't think anyone could have anticipated what happened on September 11th, and none of us knew what could happen next. And that morning, I just happened to be in Manhattan, and I got a call from my daughter who was working for a news agency in the city and said, Dad, did you see the plane hit the tower? And I said, no. She goes, turn on the TV. And I go, well, I'm sure it was just a horrible accident. And then I saw the second plane hit. And immediately, everyone knew that this was an attack, and a barbaric attack that was going to have grave consequences for New York and for America. First thing I did was call Mayor Giuliani, tell him I'm in the city. We're activating the state's emergency command response. We're going to be calling up the National Guard, putting in place mutual aid, all the actions that we had put in place uh, on paper uh, to respond to a disaster. Uh, I then called and Mayor Giuliani was at Ground Zero and said yes, and we'll stay in touch uh, as things develop. Called President Bush and talked to him about shutting down the airspace because no one knew what would happen next. And then I left and was going to go downtown to Ground Zero. And my troopers go start the car the wrong way. And I go to my security guys, you know, where are you going? And they go, well, we're taking you to the heliport. We're going to fly you to the state's emergency command bunker in Albany. And there's a command bunker there underground, can survive a nuclear bomb attack and everything. And I thought for a minute and said, you know, we're asking New Yorkers to stay calm. 
We're asking first responders, construction people, uh, construction workers, firefighters, others, to go to the scene. How can it be that their government is going to flee the scene and go to a bunker in Albany, New York? So as governor for 12 years, that is the only time I countermanded a security directive from my, from my state police and said, no, I am staying in the city. And we stayed, went to ground zero, stayed in touch with a lot of people, took the appropriate action. Uh, but what happened that morning when the towers came down is that the city's emergency command center was destroyed. They had no emergency command center. And Mayor Giuliani and all of his top emergency commissioners were trapped in the rubble of a building from probably before 10 o'clock to almost 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So I would be talking with one of his deputy mayors, and we would be coordinating what the state was doing, what the city was doing, and everything else. And finally, around 2 o'clock, I get a call from Mayor Giuliani. I'm OK. My commissioners are here. We created an emergency temporary command center at a building somewhere in lower Manhattan. And I thought for a minute, and, and, he, and I go, so you, you have the commissioners there? He goes, yes, I've called my whole team. They're all here at the temporary command center and I thought for a minute and then I said I'll be right there and I got my entire state emergency command team and I think this is the most important decision I made in 12 years and our entire team went to the city's emergency command and that afternoon and every day for months thereafter we'd sit in one room around a square grouping of tables. Every relevant commissioner of the city, every relevant commissioner of the state, and we were in constant agreement as to who was supposed to do what. And later on that evening, uh, FEMA arrived. And FEMA, which has been pillory for what happened in Katrina, and I would contrast what we did with what happened in Katrina, FEMA came in from Washington. They set up at that same table. So that, the response we had on September 11th and for months thereafter, it wasn't a city response, it wasn't a state response, it wasn't a federal response, it was all of us saying, okay, you're gonna do this, I have a problem with that, they will do that. And we never missed a beat, city, state, and federal working together to make sure every action that could be taken to get us through that horrible period was taken. Now compare that, contrast that with Katrina, which was just tragic, and I, I hope some of you are old enough to remember Katrina. But there, you had the city blaming the state, the state blaming the feds, the feds blaming the city. You had a disorganized response by three different groups. I think the most important thing was to say, we're all going to sit there together and we're gonna have one unified response. And when the stakes were that high, the lesson here is to learn that when you're leading, your leadership isn't about you. It's about the people you are seeking to help. You know, well, thank you, thank you. And, and so often, politicians, it's about their headline. It's about their press clip. It's about their picture in the newspaper. And I don't want to name any names, but a group of prominent Washington politicians flew up a couple of days later. And within 30 seconds, they were fighting over the camera. Uh, and that never happened with us. It was too important for America. It was too important for New York. It was too important for everyone who cared about what happened that day, which are billions of people worldwide, that we have one voice one response, one focus, and that was doing everything we could to protect and help the people of America. So I think that last lesson is probably the most important. It's not about you having a personal victory through your leadership. It's not about you imposing your will to accomplish something. It's about having a clear goal as to what you try, are trying to accomplish on behalf of the people you lead, not on behalf of yourself, and ultimately looking, taking whatever action you can to achieve that result. I just want to close on one thing about leadership for the country today. You know, one of the things that will always stay with me 
about September 11th and the time thereafter was the sense of unity among the American people. I remember that day walking the streets of lower Manhattan, and there was no such thing as a Republican, a Democrat, a black or white, a rich or poor, a young or old. We were all Americans who had been through a horrible attack. And one of the reasons we came through that horrible time so well was that sense of unity permeated all of America. I don't, perhaps it, we had that sense of unity after Pearl Harbor, but in my lifetime, I have never seen Americans stand so strongly together. And that is why the response was so effective and so powerful. Think of where we are today. Think of how people try to polarize or divide, pit one group against another group. Leadership in this country is about understanding we're all Americans. We may have different approaches to specific issues, but we all want the same thing. We all have a common destiny. We all want this country to have the brightest future it possibly can. That's why you're at Wofford. That's why we are here trying to help you at Wofford. Let's understand differences, but ultimately, let's try to find common ground. And leadership is moving forward on that common ground, not for personal, partisan, or ideological interest, but for the people's interest. So thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And now I hope we can have some questions and answers. Thank you. Uh, if you would like to raise your hand, I can bring the microphone to you. Governor Pataki, question from a New Yorker here, actually. Nah, you're a New Yorker. I am. I am. I'm from Buffalo, actually. Um, you must be very happy to be there. Oh, I, I, I am. I am. I'm not buried, so I Yeah, there's not six feet you. of snow down here. Uh, anyway, my question is, is, you know, a lot of my fellow students are going to be going to the polls for the first time in uh, 2016. A lot of what's good? I'm sorry. Oh, a, a lot of my fellow students, we're going to be going to the polls for the first time in 2016. And... Uh, you know, it seems like over the past six years, there hasn't been really a lot of leadership coming out of Washington. Now, be fair, you know, be charitable to the president. The legislature hasn't really done him any favors. But my question is, is uh, what sort of qualities would you look for in the uh, presidential candidates in 2016? You know, I th uh, did you all hear that? What sort of quality is presidential candidate in 2016? I think someone who offers solutions and, and who has ideas as opposed to just criticizing. One of my real concerns about politics these days is that it is so entirely negative. Uh, one party rails against the other party being bad. The other party says the other are extremists. Let's offer solutions. Let, let's look at the problems this country faces, uh, whether it's financial, economic, uh, security problems globally, and listen to someone who lays out an agenda of solutions. And I'll just give you one little thought on that. I think uh, the federal government has become far too big, far too powerful, far too intrusive, far too expensive. And when you talk about sustainability, as is a common word these days, the least sustainable institution in America is our federal government with almost 18 trillion in debt, not counting the debt on the entitlements. So, so it's one thing. It's one thing to point out the problem. It's another to lay out the solutions. And I'll just give you one idea that I think is when, I get, when something's too big, you have to shrink it in size. I believe we could reduce the size of the federal workforce by 15%. And now another thing to ask about a candidate is not only are they proposing ideas, but do they have any ability to implement those ideas? And uh, just I feel comfortable in saying we could reduce the size of the federal government by 15%. Because while I was governor, I reduced the size of the state government in New York by over 15%. And at the end, people weren't complaining about the lack of services. They were happy about the greater efficiency that came from that government. So look for positive solutions, ideas that will bring people together uh, and move the country forward, and the ability to actually implement those ideas as opposed to just talking about them. Governor. 
Uh, at noon today, we were talking about some similarities between South Carolina and New York. And one of them, I believe I'm right about this, New York and South Carolina are both fighting the common core. Do you have any opinions about that? Yeah, I do. I, I, uh, it, it, and it, uh, did you all hear that, uh, New York? New York, the government is not fighting Common Core. In fact, the governor had been supporting Common Core, core but there are a great many of us who are uh, opposed to that. And one of the things that I think I've read off the bat is just what I was saying about how the federal government becoming way too intrusive. Since when is it Washington's role or the federal government's role to tell a state what its curriculum should be? You know, education has always been the prerogative of the states, and I think it should continue to be the prerogative of the states. I'm a great believer in the Tenth Amendment. You know, the power is not specifically granted to Congress or to Washington and reserved to the states or the, pe the people and the states. So, so yes, it is something that many of us in New York think is inappropriate, um, and I'm sure here in South Carolina as well. And I'll just tell you one example. One of my aides in my office uh, as, a, as a child in first grade, six years old. And I did, I don't only brag, but I did really well in math uh, in, in throughout high school and college. And she goes, Governor, this is Common Core. Take a look at this question. This is for our first grader. And she goes, I can't figure this out. And it's a basic math question. I look at, I didn't have a clue what the answer was. Either I am dumber than the average American first grader, which is always a possibility, and my opponents would probably agree with that, or there was something wrong with Common Core. I think it's the other way around. I think there's something wrong with Common Core. Okay. Hold it, hold it. Thank you. Governor, I wondered if you'd comment on the recent uh, resignation of uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Chuck Hagel, and if you would comment on our foreign policy, especially in regard to uh, Iraq and Syria. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I'm not surprised Secretary Hagel resigned. Uh, when you heard his comments, uh, one, I don't think he would have liked to preside over a further downscaling of the American military. Uh, the President has proposed reducing it to pre-World War II status. I think that is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, the, the, we are, we are, in my view, we are most more at risk today than we have been at any time since September 11th. Uh, and just today, there was a warning to U.S. military personnel in the United States to beware of identifying themselves as military on social media or wearing their uniforms because they fear they're going to be taxed in the U.S. against United States military personnel. This is a time we should be strengthening our military, not weakening. Uh, and I think that is absolutely critical, and I would imagine, although I can't speak for him, Secretary Hagel did not want to uh, preside over a further dismantling of, uh, of our military capability. The second is ISIS. He said we're not going to defeat ISIS without going after them in Syria and without having a more aggressive U.S. approach. I totally agree. Every day that ISIS exists is a growing threat to us, and it is ISIS that is the reason for that warning that the government put out today to U.S. military. <coughs> I think we have to be far more proactive. The President talks about, over time, destroying ISIS. We have to work to try to kill them today. Uh, I was the governor on September 11th, and Al-Qaeda uh, managed to pull off a horrible, barbaric series of acts that set this country back thousands of lives, but also economically for a long time. And they didn't have any money. They didn't have any internet capability. They were isolated in Afghanistan. Think of ISIS, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, tr advanced weaponry, social media capability. They're rec recruiting jihadists over the internet. And thousands of people with Western passports and possibly citizenship. They pose a very real threat to our security and our safety. And we have to be far more aggressive in going after and destroying them. <laughs> well, first of all, I would like to say thank you so much for coming tonight to Wofford College. And secondly, that uh, you talked about troops in Afghanistan. And what do you think about troops 
and Afghanistan at the moment. Um, do you agree there and there, or do you want them to come out of Afghanistan? And do you think they have helped since 2002 when they they went in there? And um, the other, sorry, I <laughs> have so much questions. And the other thing that. Um, the troops were sent um, to Afghanistan after 9-11-2001. Um, do you think it's because of 9-11? Why they didn't send the troops before that? Thank you. Yeah, I think um, there's no question that uh, w the reason we went into Afghanistan was because of the attacks of September 11th. But I think we should have learned a lesson that when we have terrorist groups with safe havens where they can recruit, train, organize, and plan attacks against us, uh, even if it was from Afghanistan as opposed to areas far more connected to the Western world, we have to be proactive in going after and denying them those camps and just destroying them. Uh, my son just got back, my younger son just got back from Afghanistan in September. He's in the 10th Mountain Division. So I don't think any of us want to see hundreds of thousands of American troops. Uh, and I don't think the United States should engage in nation building. What we should do is just support those <coughs> who are on our side when they are incapable of controlling parts of their country where terrorists have camps, just go in quickly and destroy as many of them and as much as possible and leave a little note saying we're leaving, but you come back, so will we. Uh, just overwhelming force, short period of time, come back home and support those governments overseas that are on our side in the war against terror. Um, hello, Governor. In the case of us possibly de deploying troops to another country, um, do you think it would be wise that we could set a sort of time limit? Or would that somehow limit our military capability within that region? I, 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 two things on that. First of all, um, there is, under the existing law, a limit on the president's authority to take military action in the case of an emergency for a specific period of time, which is why I think the president made a mistake with ISIS in not going to Congress and getting an authorization for us to use military force to destroy ISIS. Uh, in Great Britain, they had an all-day debate in the House of Commons before approving authorization. We should have had that debate. We would have approved it. ISIS this is a horrible organization that poses a threat to our safety, and we would have been able to take more dramatic action. I don't believe we should tell the enemy what we're going to do. I think that is always a hideous blunder to say that we're going to have a surge in Afghanistan, but we're going to start pulling everybody out on this particular date. Just as, all right, I'll go hide in my cave until the day after. I mean, it's just ridiculous. One of the prime elements of warfare is to keep your enemy off balance, off guard, so they don't know what you're doing. <clears throat> and sadly, among other mistakes this administration has made, is too often this president has said exactly what his timetable is, when in fact the timetable has to be adaptable based on the conditions. Um, hi. Is this working? Okay. Um, it's easy to feel like when you're voting, like you don't know exactly how much of an impact your vote has, like you go in and you vote. And I was wondering how, like on a local level and national level, how much does, uh, do votes count and what the people want really count? Uh, I, I think that is something that every American should appreciate, the importance of their one vote. It's not just that elections oftentimes are decided by just a handful of votes and all you have to do is go back to the 2000 presidential election uh, where they were actually counting individual ballots in one community in Florida that could have determined the next president of the United States. That points out the practical consequences. But you have to understand this is a democracy. And to the 
extent people don't feel their participation matters, it is left to those who have self-interest, who have an ax to grind, who have a rabid partisan purpose, as opposed to putting the public interest first. And I think one of the sad things in this country is that uh, we have not had broader public participation in the political process. And I think part of that is because there hasn't been the inspirational leadership where people can say, that's a person, you know, he may not be in my party, she may not be of my philosophy, but at least that person is offering solutions, many of which I agree with, to get more people involved. So it's not just your one vote that counts. Our democracy depends on every American believing their one vote counts and participating at every level. I'll tell you, you know, here I am, and we're talking about the 2016 presidency, but I learned starting as a district leader in my hometown of Peekskill, uh, talking to people about the importance of their vote, not because I was running for anything, but because it matters for the nature of this country. So vote, encourage your friends to vote, encourage them to get involved, and don't just passively vote. Let your voices be heard and get involved. And maybe even if, like me, someday you completely use your, lose your mind, run for office. <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> Hi. Um, going back to 9-11 and Katrina, what do you think the difference was that caused a less unified response for Katrina than 9-11? I'm sorry, say that again. I couldn't quite. Why do you think there was a less unified response for Katrina rather than 9-11? Well, I think, uh, I think a lot of it comes down to the topic of this subject, which is leadership. You know, the, the fact that we had all three leaders, uh, the, the governor of the state, the mayor of the city, and the national head of FEMA sitting at the same table in the same room uh, almost guaranteed that we would have a unified response. If we had been in three different settings, working with three different groups of our commissioners and experts, <coughs> You couldn't have had that level of coordination. And in the case in Katrina, there wasn't that commitment. There wasn't that unity. You had three separate responses, city response, state response, federal response, none of whom could do it as well individually as all three could do working together. So it comes down to leadership, and it comes down to, to what you're trying to accomplish, which is to put a crisis behind the people as quickly and as, as, as successful a way as possible. Once again, I'd just like to thank you for um, taking the time to listen to our questions and thank talk you. to us here at Wofford. This is fun. Um, one of the things you've mentioned kind of previously today at lunch and also is unity as well as going beyond partisan politics. It's a lot of stuff in Washington, D.C. A lot of people right now are just feeling like either they can't trust the government in different ways like that. One of the ways you mentioned is when you were governor in New York, you dealt with, I think it was either the Congress or the ha like, but that they were actually of a different um, political party than you by a vast number. Um, how do you see just us going in a future direction of just how you experienced in New York dealing with that and just how we can really come together as a whole? Well, I think the key is to point out your vision of where you want to go to. Because I think, you know, like uh, I was telling earlier, I was telling a story to a different group. Uh, when I was running in 1994, the first time, uh, I was running as a conservative Republican with tough crime policies, educational reform policies, reducing tax cuts. And I went to the Abyssinian Baptist Church, which is a famous African-American church in Harlem. And the, the pastor had me speak, and I said, you know, what you want for your kids is exactly what I want for my kids. You want your kids to grow up in a community where they're safe, where they can go play in a park or walk to school and not have to worry about crime. You want them to go to a school where they're going to learn something, and they're going to be able to achieve the maximum that their potential allows them to accomplish. And when they do that, you want them to be in a community where there are jobs and there are opportunities so they don't have to go elsewhere. So what I always tried to do uh, was to talk to people who may not have had the same approach to the solutions or the same political philosophy that I did about our common goals. And when you achieve that, 
you at the very least take away the animosity and the finger pointing which seems to dominate Washington. At least you can respectfully disagree and at best you can say, well yeah, I agree with you on those goals. Let's sit down and figure out how we can achieve them together. So I think in the absence of that vision, the, the, the solution differences, the partisan differences, the philosophical differences loom large. But when you start with where you have a vision to get to, you can find a way to come together. And that is sadly not what has happened in Washington. And it hadn't been what was happening in New York, but I was lucky enough or fortunate enough to be able to accomplish a great deal with that approach. And I'll just give you one more example on, on that. You know, I, um, when I ran for office, one in 11 of every resident in the state of New York was on welfare. Uh, not of the poor or the disabled or the elderly. One in 11 of every man, woman, child in the entire state of New York from the tip of Long Island to the Adirondack Mountains to Buffalo was on welfare. And it had to be a system, uh, it was a system that had to be changed. And the normal rhetoric coming from the conservative Republican side where I was coming from would have been we have to save money, there are people taking advantage of the system, you know, we have to uh, get people off just the, the door my approach was completely different. My philosophy was the same, but what, the way I saw it is the state had created a system where people would look at their family's interest. And am I better off taking a job for eight or nine dollars an hour? Or am I better off getting government benefits? What we had done is create a system where a mother who cares about her kids came to the logical conclusion that she's better off on welfare. But these were people who weren't different. They want to live the American dream. They want to climb the economic ladder of opportunity. They want to have the pride and self-worth that comes from earning a paycheck, talking to their neighbors about their job, talking to their kids about what their work was like. They have the same aspirations, the same desires, but they were trapped in a system that rationally made them better off dependent on government. So we had to dramatically change that system, not to demonize people, but to empower people with opportunity instead of dependency. And when I left New York, and there was a lot of controversy over the steps we took along the way, but they all worked, we had 1,040,000 fewer people on welfare than we did when I took office. And those were people who had begun the process of becoming proud, contributing Americans living the American dream instead of people dependent on a paternalistic government. And so it's that approach of talking, trying to have people understand we're all in this together. We all want to see each other succeed. And when people who have been trapped in dependency begin to climb that ladder of opportunity, it helps every one of us. And, and that's the message that I would bring. Governor, um, one of the the big domestic issues right now is is immigration. How does the you know the Republicans have a tremendous opportunity right now to lead? How do they lead through this? Is they uh, fix the intermingled web of immigration with the entitlement system that may be due to to a new citizen of the country? Yeah. I, I, I think the President's uh, executive order, I think, was very unfortunate, to be kind. Uh, I think uh, there was, and perhaps still is, an opportunity to sit down with the new Congress and try to find the common ground and come up with solutions. And I fear the President's immigration order uh, doesn't solve the problem, it compounds the problem and creates confusion. Uh, one is it affects apparently around five million people, but that leaves over six million uh, with a status that's completely unclear. And even those five million, can it be reversed? Was it legal? Uh, is it going to work? So I think there's enormous uh, uncertainty there. But there are two other enormous problems I think the President has made with uh, his executive order. The first is, I think if you're concerned about the security of this country, 
we have to control our borders. Uh, yes, there are immigrants coming here to live the American dream and get a job and build a life, better life for their family. But we also know there are stretches of the border controlled by drug lords, criminal gangs, violent groups profiting from crossing the border. And we also know that terrorist groups want to use that border to bring people here to attack us in the United States. No great country can be confident of its sovereignty or security unless we have control of the border. And by doing this, uh, legalizing the status by the signing of a pen of five million people, the president is telling people who think about coming here illegally, it's okay, I'll break the law, but they've done it twice now. All I have to do is stay there long enough and they'll do it again. So we create an incentive for people to come here illegally, and that is a bad thing. Uh, so what I would have done, and what I would hope that Congress would do if it's looking at a law, would be to say that any provisions of those laws that we are considering to uh, rationalize the status of those who are here illegally only takes effect after the Secretary of Homeland Security can certify for a number of months that fewer than 100 people have crossed the border of the United States illegally. And that not only does that have to be in place before any provision of the law takes effect, but the law is automatic, automatically suspended whenever the, the, in any month where the Secretary of Homeland Security can't certify that we have solid and effective control of our borders. What that does is it say, all right, if you want to come here illegally, you're not going <coughs> to be able to get the benefit of an amnesty. And by the way, if you're already here and you want to have your status clarified and perhaps legalized, you should tell friends who are thinking of coming here not to do it because if they do, the law is going to be suspended. So all of a sudden, we know we control the border and we know those who want to take advantage of an opportunity to have legalized status will help us to deter those from coming here illegally. The second is, we're the United States of America. We don't have a king telling us what to do. We are dependent on the rule of law. The Constitution and the laws of this country are what protect all of our rights. And if we don't have respect for those laws, if we don't have a population that understands there are consequences when you break the law, then we are undermining the rule of law, which is the basis for all our freedoms. And when the president tells five million people, it's okay, you broke the law, don't worry about it, you're here. I think he is sending another wrong message that there are no consequences to breaking the law. Now, I don't think anybody who looks at this rationally is going to say, we're going to put 11.2 million people or however many in boxcars and send them back to wherever they came from. That's not going to happen. But I think what we can say is to those who do, who have obeyed the law, have worked, have paid taxes, have uh, contributed to society, and who might be eligible for uh, legalized status, you broke the law. You have to recognize it, and you have to pay a penalty for having broken that law. And my suggestion would be that we do what we do when there are violations in a community. When someone takes some bad act but you don't want to put them to jail, you give them community service. And what I would say is to anyone in that condition, the illegal status, who wants to be legalized and has all the appropriate background to qualify, you have to perform. 100 hours, 200 hours of community service. Working in a hospital, <coughs> working in a school, in a library, or in a park, working to help a volunteer fire department or something, to recognize you broke the law and there was a penalty pa to, to breaking that law. That would show respect for the rule of law. It would require people not to acknowledge that they broke the law. And it would, I think, help us as a society going forward. So I think the president's actions were unfortunate. I still hope Congress makes an effort to pass a comprehensive law, but it has to do two things. Make sure the border is secure. Make sure there is a sanction, a penalty, for having broken the law. Thank you. You know, one of the things that I have enjoyed about it, it's probably bored you to death, is, you know, politics today is you solve the most important problem in the world in 20 seconds or less, uh, or 140 characters or less, and that's it. You're done. You've solved the problem. And I apologize for some of the answers that are a little long, but I think that's really, if you want to have a serious dialogue about leadership or about government, you can't do it in 20 seconds. Hi, Governor. Hi. Uh, a little bit earlier, we talked about, you know, traits that would 
make a good presidential candidate in 2016. Are you gearing up for a campaign in 2016, and what, what traits do you think you, you would bring to that office? Well, you know, I was kidding earlier. I had a session at lunch. Uh, every four years, there's the Olympics, there's the World Cup, and Pataki shows up back in South Carolina thinking about running for president. Uh, but this time, it is a little different. You know, I, I have been in the private sector for eight years. I love the private sector. Everything is going so well. My kids are all doing great. My wife, our dogs are healthy. Everything is good. But I turn on the radio or the television. I go on the internet. I read a newspaper. And I just see things getting apparently worse and worse. I don't see solutions being proposed. I don't see action being taken. I don't see the problems that this country faces, and we face very serious problems being addressed. Uh, and I think it would be wrong for any of us, not just me, to sit back and say, well, in these troubling times, you know, I'm just going to live, live my own life and not try to help make things better. Uh, you know, uh, a number of pe I, people still come up to me on the street in New York all the time and say hi, and a number of them have said, you know, aren't you glad you're not in office now? And I thought, and I think to myself, and I go, no. When things are easy, anybody can do the job. When things are the most difficult, that's when leadership matters, and that's when you should want the job. So I am very seriously considering it, and I think, um, for two basic reasons. One is I believe I have ideas, solutions to the problems facing the country that I don't hear being advanced. And the second is I know I can run a large, complex, difficult government well. Uh, I did that for 12 years. And believe me, in New York State, politics is not exactly a bowl of cherries. But it was wonderful. Uh, and it was a tremendous privilege and a tremendous experience. So if you believe you have the ability to lead effectively, and you believe you have ideas and solutions to the problems the, the country is facing, and you just sit back and lead your own selfish life, um, I think that would be kind of hard to take. Thank you. Governor, uh, basically going off of what you... It's working. Okay. Uh, basically going off of the last question, um, forgive me, I forget who said this. I think it was, uh, might have actually been uh, Mitt Romney, but he said for this upcoming uh, election, the 2016 election for the president, that he thinks that it should be um, somebody like you said who want to go in You know, the, the, my flip answer would be, I think it should be someone who served three terms as a governor of a large northeastern <laughs> state. <laughs> but that's the kind of answer Governor Christie would give, so I won't do that. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, there are going to be a lot of great candidates, and that's a service to democracy and a service to America. Uh, it's easy to talk. It's harder to act. And I think having had executive experience is valuable. But there may well be a candidate whose background is legislative who's better than a candidate whose background is from the executive side. So I think we have to look at the individuals. But I think that having that executive experience, having run complex government, uh, should be considered a positive. I mean, we just tried someone who, who never had any expe executive experience and who had been a legislator. And in my view, that hasn't worked out all that well. So maybe we'll try something different. <laughs> yes, Governor, uh, I understand we have term limits for presidents. Uh, what are your th thoughts and ideas about term limits for members of Congress? I am all for it. Uh, I think uh, term limits are important. Uh, some states have it. Uh, the difference, president obviously is national, passed by a constitutional amendment. Congress, the, the qualifications for Congress are under the Constitution set by the states. And some states have term limits. Uh, other states don't. New York, my state, uh, they'll never have term limits because once you get there, they want to be there forever, I fear. And it's unfortunate. But I do 
think term limits are important because I think the whole concept of our democracy was not that we have a permanent political class, but that we have people from all walks of life who set aside whatever they're doing at the moment to take some time to provide their skills, their ideas, and their leadership to Congress. But that's not the way it is now. Too many of them are there forever. And I think it's a disservice to America. And just one other point on that. You know, the government is not just too big, too powerful, too expensive, too intrusive, and non-sustainable. Uh, one of the lines I use is we talk about banks or other groups that are too big to fail. The federal government is too big to succeed, and it needs to be scaled back. But it also, that power creates an enormous game playing in Washington. And you want to know, you ask yourselves, where well, the most expensive real estate in America is today? It's not New York, you know, the financial capital of America. It's not Los Angeles, the entertainment media capital of America. It's not Silicon Valley, the technological center of America. It's Washington, D.C. What do they make in Washington, D.C.? They make regulations, credits, exemptions, rules, laws. It, it has become something where so many people are corrupted, not criminally, but corrupted in the sense that they know if they go along, they're going to be fine. Today, there are almost 500 former members of the House and Senate who are lobbyists in Washington, D.C. You know that after six months there, you can either stay there for life in office, or if by some quirk you lose or don't run again, you don't go back. You stay in Washington and make 10 times as much as you would if you came back to South Carolina or came, went back to upstate New York. And that is wrong, and, and we have to change that system. And I propose two, in addition to scaling back the size of the government, I propose two other reforms. First of all, Congress and its staff should have to live under every single law they pass. They pass a law. They pass a law like Obamacare that's supposed to be good for all of us and then exempt themselves because they want a better deal. That isn't leadership. That's, in my view, corruption. And the second is, given those almost 500 former members of Congress serving as lobbyists, I would pass a law that if you serve one day in the House or one day in the Senate, there is a lifetime ban on your ever being a lobbyist in Washington. You should, you should live up. You should live up to your office and not off it once you leave the office. And by the way, without any of those former members of Congress lobbying, there'd be more work for Van to do there to make, uh, to help uh, contribute more to Wofford so he could make this great college even better. Thank you, Governor Pataki, uh, for coming to visit us. Um, you, were, you just mentioned Obamacare. I felt like that'd be a good segue. Uh, you talked about the increasing size of government, and um, I just want to know if we're, we're if we're ever going to see that law repealed. Uh, there's been talk about it. You but know, I, I, I think Obamacare is the worst law passed in my lifetime, and I tried very hard. I tried very hard to work against it. And if anybody ever had any doubts, I hope you've seen the comments of Professor Gruber, who was the, uh, the MIT professor who was the brains behind it. And if you didn't see it, he gave an interview where he was talking about it. And he was asked the question, shouldn't it have been more transparent? And he goes, no, transparent is bad. It was important the American people didn't know what was in it because the voters were too stupid to understand. The, the author of Obamacare actually used that expression, the voters are too stupid. And you combine that with Nancy Pelosi saying, you'll find out what's in it after we pass it. Well, we found out what's in it, and it's not remotely what they had talked about. So I think it should be repealed. But beyond that, I think the odds are very good that it will be declared unconstitutional. Part of it already was, but there is a case now close to the Supreme Court. The law explicitly says that the federal government can subsidize exchanges created by a state. 37 of the exchanges are not created by a state, but by the federal government because the states decline. Washington is subsidizing them. Now, Obama has continually, I believe, illegally rewritten the law to change terms that were plain. He can't rewrite this one, and I would not, be, I would believe that the Supreme Court would strike that down, at which time it is, it'll be clear Obamacare is not just unconstitutional, it can't work. So I am very hopeful that we will see a far better law going forward. Thank you. 
Governor, we talked about a lot of things happen uh, in the United States. So I'm wondering that what's your opinion about the foreign policies to China and India? Do you think they will be a threat to the United States? You know, I, uh, I'm always asked, uh, will China be a threat? And I think uh, uh, the answer is China doesn't know what its future is going to be. They have internal debates and conflicts. But we do know it's becoming more economically powerful, more militarily powerful, and more assertive in the world. And I think there are a number of things we should do. One is we have to rebuild our military. We cannot shrink our military. We have to increase our capability, uh, both to the protect ourselves here and globally to protect and support our friends. The second is we have to stand with our allies. Uh, time and again, uh, there have been those who are clearly on our side who we have let down. Uh, and just one example in my mind, and Van is the expert here, is when Mubarak, who had been America's guy in Egypt for 30 years, was overthrown. The Muslim Brotherhood, which is an Islamic group that is not friendly to us, comes to power. We are very support of, us, of the Muslim Brotherhood, and then when the military comes back with an anti-Islamic uh, coup, we do not support them. We should support our friends, we should stand with them, we should stand with uh, allies like Israel, uh, who have been steadfast allies throughout. Uh, and by the way, the third thing, rebuild our military, stand with our allies and support our friends. And the third is when we, we say, there will be consequences, or we are going to draw a red line. We have to meet it. You know, it is absolutely appalling to go on national television and say, we have drawn a red line, and then a short period of time later to say, never mind. And when Russia and its thug allies invaded Ukraine, how many times did you hear, there will be serious consequences, there will be serious consequences, there will be serious consequences? When your word is laughed at globally, it doesn't matter how much power you have, because you also need to be trusted and believed. So we need a policy where we stand with our allies, where we say what we mean and stand behind it if it is challenged, and where, when we rebuild our military. And I think, I think the American people would be very supportive, and the globe would be appreciative of a, re, uh, of a recognition again of America's strength. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Van. Uh, uh, let me just say one last thing. I look forward to seeing Wofford and the NCAAs going further and further this year. Good luck. Go Terriers. Wofford College combines a challenging liberal arts education with a close-knit campus community. Located in Spartanburg, South Carolina, Wofford offers 25 major fields of study and a faculty that mentors students to think independently, develop goals, and work creatively. At Wofford, 93% of students choose to live on campus all four years. It's an enriching residential experience that culminates at The Village. The NCAA Division I Wofford Terriers compete in the Southern Conference across 18 teams. As the Terriers continue to excel with community support, they're always the best game in town. A few miles away is Wofford's Goodall Environmental Study Center. Overlooking Lawson's Fork of the Pakalit River, the center features exceptional opportunities for hands-on environmental experience. While Wofford's campus can take your breath away, nestled in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains and just a few hours from the beach, Wofford ranks consistently as a top 10 college for study abroad experience. Students are prepared for the world after Wofford. At the space, students learn skills and find experiences that employers need and graduate schools want. 
our graduates are prepared for what's next. Wofford College, it's your world. Wofford College combines a challenging liberal arts education with a close-knit campus community 